delight to welcome you to our lecture today. For those of you who don't know me, I think I know most of you. My name is Martha Stroud and I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Advanced Genocide Research at the USC Shoshua Foundation. And today we are here to listen to a lecture by Professor Jenny Burnett. Jenny is an Associate Professor of Global Studies and Anthropology and Associate Director of the Global Studies Institute at Georgia State University in Atlanta. Her beautiful book, Genocide Lives in Us, Women, Memory, and Silence in Rwanda, won the 2013 Elliott Skinner Award from the Association for Africanist Anthropology. She earned her BA in French and Comparative Literature from Boston University and her PhD in Anthropology from the Chapel Hill. Prior to entering academia, Professor Burnett served on the board of directors of Amnesty International USA and with organizations including Care International, AfriCare, and the North Carolina Healthy Start Foundation. Professor Burnett has held several prestigious grants and fellowships, including a National Science Foundation senior research grant, which I believe is what funded this project a Rockefeller Visiting Fellowship at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, and a United States Institute of Peace Jennings Randolph Peace Scholar Dissertation Fellowship, among others. We are delighted to have her here and can't wait to hear about her research, her project on rescue in Rwanda. So please join me in welcoming Professor Burnett. Thank you. I'm just going to move my stuff out of the spot for anyone who wants to move forward. So thank you. It's a great honor to be here today. And thank you, um, Dr. Stroud, for the very generous introduction. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today uh, about my recent research looking at rescue during the Rwandan genocide. Uh, this project was funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, it's based on my, my long-term trajectory. My, my work in general explores the social, cultural, and psychological aspects of war genocide and mass violence, as well as the micro-level impact of large-scale social change in the context of conflict. Um, my research encompasses three primary areas. The first is uh, the long-term cultural, social, and psychological consequences of violence during conflict on women's agency and women's roles in post-genocide uh, reconstruction and reconciliation in Rwanda. I published the, most of this research in my book, Genocide Lives in Us, uh, which Martha already mentioned. Um, in the book, I write what I call an ethnography of survival and explore the contradictory roles that women played in the post-genocide reconciliation in Rwanda. Um, and uh, another key area of my research, mostly published in articles, looks at women's roles in politics, democratization, and peace building in Rwanda, and the sort of gender renaissance that the country has undergone. Rwanda has more women in parliament, or a greater percentage of women in parliament than any other country in the world, and has for uh, a very long time now. More recently, I've turned to look at understanding organized resistance, rescuer behavior, and uh, motivations in the 1994 genocide in Rwanda, genocide of Tutsis in Rwanda. This was funded, the title, it was funded under with National Science Foundation, intrinsic and extrinsic factors in rescuer behavior. Uh, and I will note this fine print here that any of what I say today is my opinion and does not reflect that of the National Science Foundation <laughs> nor the US government. On this project, I worked with a team of collaborators. Uh, this is a list of them. I was the PI on the project. I worked closely with my co-investigator, 
Dr. Hagar El Hadidi, who is a professor at California State University in Bakersfield at this time. Uh, Ilde Fonsen Hillier, who is the associate director of the Research Center at the Catholic University of Kabgai, and several research assistants and interpreters in Rwanda and the, in the United States. <coughs> and they have asked for me not to include their names in public presentations um, of the research. Uh, we worked closely with two associations in this research, actually three, I've left one off the list. Um, Ibuka, the Genocide Survivors Association, was a close collaborator, and the Association des Musulmans du Rwanda, the Muslim Association of Rwanda, and then the Catholic University at Kabgai, which sponsored our research permit. The key questions this project sought to answer um, was how and why do some people put themselves at risk, uh, at great risk of harm, to rescue others in instances of communal violence or genocide? Many others had, um, when I undertook this research, had already tried to understand the reasons why perpetrators participated in the genocide, and I was interested in understanding how and why people didn't participate in the genocide or even went further and risked their own well-being to save people. Uh, to put it more in theoretical language, what intrinsic and extrinsic factors motivate or facilitate individuals or groups of individuals to resist violence and engage in acts of rescue. Now this project moved forward predicated on the sort of standard genocide studies paradigm or typology of different kinds of actors in genocide. Um, you're probably, many of you are familiar with, there are victims. Those are the people targeted in the genocide. There are perpetrators, those who participate in and uh, perpetrate violence in genocide. The bystanders, those who are not targeted and who don't participate, but also who don't intervene in any way to assist people who are being targeted. And then the rescuers, people who risk uh, their own well-being or their family well-being to try to assist or otherwise save people. So this, this typology has been used in genocide studies because it helps to clarify the characteristics and motivations of people in each category. Within the discipline of social psychology in particular, these categories and the concept of altruism have come to dominate theory and have shaped the empirical findings of experimentation. Yet, as Leanne Fuji, who's primarily written on the Rwandan genocide, pointed out, these categories can obscure as much as they reveal. Uh, because this typology reduces a person with their complex, often contradictory, beliefs and actions to an expected set of behaviors. The typology fails to capture the dynamic nature of decision making in the intense and rapidly changing contexts that characterize mass violence. And I'll get more into the complexity um, of this later in my talk, but I just want to provide that as a framework. So who are rescuers? Um, in Holocaust studies, the concept of re rescuer was sort of uh, put forward in a very specific and concrete manner by Yad Vashem in Israel, uh, the definition of righteous among nations. And um, according to Yad Vashem, to be a righteous among the nations, it's any non-Jew who risked his life, his freedom, or his safety, and I apologize for the gendered language there, there's not mine. Um, saved one or more Jews uh, without any financial compensation or other reward. Um, in Rwanda, Ibuka, the Genocide Survivors Association in 2009 commissioned a pilot study to try, try to identify people they called Endakemwa, which is a Kinyarwanda word meaning righteous people. Uh, in French, often called les justes, or in English, the righteous ones. Uh, Ibuka based its definition on Yad Vashem's but added some additional criteria. So they said it's anyone who saved one or more Tutsis, did not receive compensation for their actions, did not participate in the genocide by killing, physically assaulting, tracking, hunting, denouncing, revealing Tutsis, or stealing or destroying Tutsis' property. Uh, and then finally that they testified about the genocide and did not spread genocide ideology. Now, one of the challenges of this last criteria is it's an ongoing requirement. So you can be identified as an endokemwa and lose that status if it's deemed that you're violating this principle. I don't know that that's happened, but that is 
a reality of the way this uh, term has been identified. So um, I worked with Ibuka. They only did a pilot study. They have identified Indochemwa in a sample of sectors in Rwanda. They have not found funding to do this nationwide in a more concrete manner. Uh, to date, um, their, their efforts have not been picked up yet by the national government. Um, it's unclear if they will, although the national government has made efforts to identify national heroes, and there are national heroes who are identified for their actions in the genocide. I'm not going to talk about that here um, today, but that is part of um, what happened. So in my study, how I operationalized the concepts of rescuer and rescuer behavior are as fo follows. We defined a rescuer as anyone who protected, evacuated, or otherwise assisted Tutsis and who did not participate in the genocide by killing, raping, ordering others to commit acts of genocide, denouncing Tutsis in hiding, or people assisting Tutsis, or looting the property of Tutsis. So much in the way that Endekem was de defined. However, we did not do exhaustive research on people. So I can't say that anyone we've identified as a rescuer would qualify as an endokemwa as well, because we didn't have the means to do that. We were sort of doing social science research and not the very important but distinct act of identifying people for public recognition. Uh, we define rescuer behavior as actions taken to protect, evacuate, evacuate or otherwise assist Tutsi or other potential targets of the genocide, whether or not the individual may also have participated in the genocide. Uh, earlier researchers had already identified this very common phenomenon. Many perpetrators also saved people. Uh, many perpetrators saved many people. Many perpetrators were able to save many people because they were perpetrators. It allowed them greater power. Um, and I'm not saying that that is morally equivalent to being a rescuer or being a rescuer who died alongside Tutsis. I'm not saying that at all, but it is, from a social science phenomenon, we have to understand that as well as rescue. We also, uh, and I'm not going to talk much about this here, but an underlying principle is we define resistance as active or passive refusal to participate in the genocide. Uh, researchers in Rwanda have identified uh, people in Rwanda, ordinary Rwandans, most of whom are subsistence far farmers, have a, a wide variety of strategies to avoid government mandates of their behavior. Um, and often these are passive refusals to do things. And this played a role in the, in the genocide as well. Unfortunately, often strategies of passive refusal would eventually lead to you being implicated in participating in the genocide as well. Uh, and in genocide studies research, um, resistance, when it's not an expected behavior, constitutes an exception. So in the theory of genocide studies, this is also a relevant category to look at. So in the project, we um, started off with an intention of creating eight community samples. Um, in the end, so the sample in northwestern Rwanda in Rubabu district was collapsed into a single sample. But we were also interested in looking at whether religion played a role. So in many of these places, for example, here in the south, um, we selected a community that was predominantly Muslim, a very small community, and paired it with a neighboring predominantly Christian uh, community. Um, and we did the same here in what's now today Rutsiro District on the coast, a predominantly Muslim community with an inland predominantly Christian community. In, Gis in Rubavu, we had intended, we were working in Giseni Town, and there we had intended to do one community sample in the predominantly Muslim neighborhood and one community sample, sample in the predominantly Catholic neighborhood. But over time, as we recruited participants in the research, the two community samples became so entangled we couldn't keep them separate. So we just collapsed them into one. Um, and then in Kigali, most of the places we worked were mixed Christian and Muslim neighborhoods, again, given to the greater density of the population and how they live together. Uh, I can talk, I'm only going to very briefly talk about methods. You're welcome to ask me more if you're a methods geek like me in the Q&A section. Um, but we did semi-structured interviews with a targeted sampling strategy. Um, we ended up with an over-representation of genocide survivors in our sample. That's not surprising because in Rwanda it is deemed that survivors are the ones who know the most about the genocide. Um, that is true in certain regards. And 
uh, genocide survivor testimony is given a is treated in a deferential manner in genocide studies. I do agree that's appropriate. However, many survivors were in hiding the entire time, so they're not as well able to testify about what other people did. Um, we did interview perpetrators um, defined as people who had confessed to crimes of genocide, served their time, and been released. We did not attempt to interview people who were still in prison. Uh, when we could find them, um, when they were available, available we uh, in interviewed Inda Kemwa, who had already been identified by Buka. Uh, and then when we talked to survivors, we would ask them, often in their testimony, they would say someone who had helped them. And we'd say, is that person still here? Are they alive? Can you make contact? And this is because many Rwandans who are rescuers are reluctant to testify or talk about what they did. I, I can answer questions about that later, why that might be. So, uh, and then we sought to interview religious leaders. At the time, we looked, we tried to interview Gachacha judges, hoping that they would be able to give us an overview of how the genocide had happened. Gachacha judges were grassroots level, uh, not lawyers, but judges elected from the population who tried genocide crimes across the country. And when we could, we also recruited government officials. That category included both those who were government officials in 1994 or those who are government officials now. So quickly, um, a very brief overview of the genocide and how uh, violence unfolded during the genocide. Uh, only over 100 days, beginning on the night of April 6, 1994, the triggering event was the shooting down of the president's plane as he returned from peace negotiations in a neighboring country. Within hours, roadblocks were set up across the capital city, manned by uh, the presidential guard, the special forces of the Rwandan military, and also some of them manned by Interahamwe, which was the youth wing that had of the dominant state party that had been radicalized um, and were Hutu extremists. Uh, they became the primary muscle in the genocide. And the genocide ended on July 4th, 1994, when the Rwandan Patriotic Front rebel movement won their war to overthrow the government and captured the capital city, Kigali. Uh, so Rwanda is in Central Africa, just south of the equator. It's a tiny country. It's about the size of Vermont. Um, it's at high altitude, so it's spring-like weather year-round. There's rainy seasons, there's dry seasons. Uh, a more close-up, this is the current district or provincial boundaries of the country with districts also showing. Uh, at the time in 1994, there were different, different administrative districts of the country. This can make research about the genocide very complicated and confusing because any place has up to five different place names depending on what era of Rwandan history someone is talking about. These are the pre-colonial pre names, the colonial names, the post-colonial names, and then there's the post-genocide names. Um, quickly about ethnicity in Rwanda, you will read in many places that Tutsi, who were the targeted population in the genocide, or 15% of the population, and that Hutu are 85% and that Twa are less than 1%. I've never been able to trace the original origin of these statistics. Um, they, if any of you have found it, please show it to me. Um, the most recent census where uh, ethnicity was uh, accounted for was the 1990 census in Rwanda. That census said that 10% of the population was Tutsi, 90% was Hutu, and less than 1% was Twa. However, it's widely said, and there is evidence to support the fact that many people had changed their ethnicity on their official papers in the post-colonial government because it was advantageous to be Hutu and disadvantageous to be Tutsi. In addition, there was lots of intermarriage, and it doesn't, these statistics don't account for intermarriage. Um, this image dating from the colonial period, um, the von Mecklenburg expedition. Um, in the English version of, the, um, of this expedition, sort of description of what they did, this uh, plate was entitled uh, Matusi, Mahutu, and Mutwa, the Three Peoples of Rwanda. Um, interestingly, the German version of the book does not include this image, and I am interested in figuring out how and why that was. In any case, virtually 
so this drawing sort of reflects the mythical histories that are told about ethnicity in Rwanda that structure reality. Um, and the, this image depicts sort of the stereotypical physical attributes associated with Tutsi, Hutu, and Twa in Rwanda. In this image, the Tutsi is depicted as tall and thin with aquiline features, a light brown complexion, and um, well-dressed. Uh, the Hutu, Hutu is shorter and more solid with a broad so-called negroid nose and darker skin. And the Twa is very short with uh, more body hair and um, so-called pygmy facial features. Um, I can assure you, though, that ethnicity or race in Rwanda, much less anywhere else in the world, is not nearly this simple. Although the terms Hutu, Tutsi, and Twa predate the colonial era, their meanings and importance have changed dramatically over time and varied by region. An important thing to understand is that what we call ethnicity in Rwanda has not been marked by differences in language, culture, religion, or territory in recorded history. All Rwandans speak the same language and share the same culture. In fact, historical linguistic and archaeological evidence indicate that the people who populated what today is Rwanda have shared similar ways of life, language, and culture since approximately 500 years before the Christian era. It's this shared cultural heritage that made them Rwandans. Um, actually, let me go back. So, the uh, well, the ethnic composition of Rwandan society today is unknown. It has not been uh, measured by the census since 1990. The post-genocide government removed ethnicity as a factor from bureaucratic life, and actually, as of 2002, it is in fact illegal to talk about ethnicity in certain ways because it is the crime of spreading divisionism. You are allowed to talk about it when you're talking about the past and talking about the genocide, but you're certainly not allowed to talk about it in the present. Um, these are photos of Rwandans today. Um, I could guess, as any Rwandan could, what the ethnicity of these people is by looking at them, but I can assure you I would be as right as a Rwandan about it, which is less than half the time would I be right. Um, it is very hard to know, but based on someone's looks, what you are, you can't tell by their name or anything else. It is largely an arbitrary uh, distinction, but one that is very relevant to people's lives and remains relevant today because in 1994, the label that applied to you could determine whether you lived or died. So, um, quickly, a timeline. I'm not going to get much into this. It is important to note, though, that the genocide occurred in the context of a civil war. That is a standard aspect of genocide, actually, anywhere in the world. Um, and um, since the genocide, the government has um, been run by the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Initially, they dominated the government based on a transitional arrangement uh, included in the Arusha Peace Accords, which were modified slightly as a result of the genocide. But since 2003, they've maintained their dominance through elections. Um, so they are elected governments. They have the majority of seats in the parliament, the presidency. Um, most of the cabinet seats are um, people in the RPF political party. An important factor and part of what motivated our choosing of the geographic sampling strategy of the study was the start dates of the genocide. The genocide did not start at the same time in every place across the country. Um, by 1 a.m. on April 7th, killings begin in the capital city, Kigali. In the initial hours, however, it wasn't uh, Tutsis who were targeted. Many of the people targeted were Tutsis, but it was a predetermined list of people who were opponents of the Hutu power segment of the government that was trying to take over control. In Giseni, in the Northwest, there were killings beginning by 10 a.m. on April 7th. Once news had spread that the president had been killed, members of the inter and the Mhuzamugambi youth wings of Hutu power-affiliated political parties went into the streets and began, began attacking Tutsis, or people who were perceived as being sympathizers of the RPF, and they killed them. And they stole from them, and they did other things. Um, in most, though, of northwestern, northern and northwestern Rwanda, it's April 10th is when genocide becomes a national policy. 
By this time, the hardliners have taken over the government. They have issued this as a policy order, a policy directive. And then you have, the in, you have subnational officials who are deciding whether or not to implement the genocide, if they decide to implement it, how to implement it. In the South, um, actually in inland Route Zero, we couldn't get a clear start date on the genocide somewhere between April 10th and April 14th. Um, in southern Rwanda, it starts on April 21st or 22nd, depending, and it's because the government officials in southern Rwanda refuse to implement the genocide. And so it's not into, until the, the governor of the province is removed from his position and then killed that the genocide begins in the south. Um, in terms of the relevance of ethnicity to the genocide, um, the genocide was not due to ancient tribal hatred. The ethnic and racial categories were the context for the violence, but not the cause of it. Um, many different forms of violence encompassed, were encompassed in the millions of acts that constituted the genocide. We often forget this when we're thinking about this as social sciences, but genocide is not a uniform thing. It is actually this agglomeration of thousands upon thousands of decisions and actions and behaviors unfolding over time. Um, the violence did erupt spontaneously in some places. Uh, violence was planned and practiced in advance in some places, and um, violence was ordered by national and subnational actors. Um, finally, ethnic and racial categories were given meaning over time by the exclusion of one group or another from the political process. Um, and so, um, in this way, ethnicity in Rwanda is analogous to race in the United States in many ways. Rwandans are not that different than we are, um, although we often think they are. Let's see. So, some, it's important to understand the characteristics of the violence in order to understand the decisions that people were making in this context. So, hard, Hutu power hardliners took over the national government and issued orders to commit genocide. Subnational authorities then decided whether or not to implement the orders and how to implement them. Military and police authorities played contradictory roles in this. Keep in mind, a civil war was going on. As soon as the genocide begins, the RPF begins, re renews its military campaign to take over the territory. There had been a truce um, and they immediately begin to fight. Um, both to end the genocide, but also their goal is to take over the territory and install a new government. Um, so many of the soldiers are called to the front lines. Police authorities in different communities behaved in different ways. In the South, initially, they protected Tutsis. In most of the North and Northwest, they engaged in carrying out the genocide. And at some times, police switched from protecting to implementing the genocide. Um, inter homway members initiated violence immediately in some places. Most places inter homway were implicated immediately and early in the genocide. They had already been recruited to this project ahead of the beginning of the genocide. There were killings of Tutsis beginning in October 1990. Um, and periodically from 1990 to 1994 in communities across Rwanda, there would be mob violence against Tutsis. Local authorities would decry it as male youth run amok. Um, but then there would be no investigations and no prosecutions. So this created a culture of impunity. So once the genocide started, inter Hamway knew they could pretty much do whatever they wanted and not have to face any consequences. Um, violence was not constant in the genocide, but came in waves. Uh, in our research, we found in some communities, for example, in Giseni, there was a long pause of two weeks in May in genocidal killings. And in fact, during this time, some Tutsis who had been in hiding came out. That meant that when the genocide resumed in late May, they were then easy to locate and kill. Uh, people who were hiding or protected, protecting Tutsis faced greater risk as the genocide continued. And this played a role that many people who initially, their initial reaction was to help uh, their friends, their family members, their kin. Um, often, as the pressure increased at a certain moment, they made a different decision. 
Um, let's talk quickly about perpetrators' actions, the things that they did. They killed, they engaged in rape, sexual enslavement, sexual violence, sexual mutilation, other kinds of crimes. They manned roadblocks um, and they engaged in security patrols. I should say about the security patrols, this was a normal part of life for ordinary Rwandan citizens. A couple times a month, at least one member of the household, a male youth or the head of, male head of the household had to participate in security patrols at night to ensure the security of the community. In the genocide, these security patrols came, became more frequent, more regular, and their purpose changed. Their purpose was to find Tutsis who were hiding. Mm -hmm. They also began running security patrols in the day to find people uh, hiding in swamps and in forests and other kinds of things. Often someone who was not wanting to particip participate in the genocide, one of their strategies would be to go on security patrols but not denounce people they found hiding as a way to pretend to go along. However, this, was a, this made you vulnerable to becoming implicated in the genocide um, and made it, in fact, more likely that you would begin to become an active participant in the genocide. Perpetrators engaged, engaged in looting, extortion, and theft. Um, it's important to note, Interahamwe did not always target Tutsis in their violence. They would often target businessmen and other people they had money, just simple crimes of opportunity. Um, also, lots of revenge took place in the genocide. There were lots of other violences included in the genocides besides just genocidal violence. Um, searching for people who were hiding, um, denouncing neighbors who were hiding people became more frequent as the genocide continued. Um, the bottom line is ordinary Rwandans who became perpetrators, they had to decide repeatedly of how to behave in a changing context. <clears throat> so what did rescuers do? Many of them hid Tutsis in their homes, in their stables, or elsewhere on their property. They warned their Tutsi neighbors or friends um, or other people who were being targeted of imminent attacks. In many communities, the genocide would of often begin with a mandatory meeting of the population. At that meeting, usually male heads of household had to attend. At the meeting, Tutsi men were killed at the meeting outright, or if they were members of opposition political parties. And then the other men at the meeting were told that they were gonna, how the search was gonna progress. Those people, those men would sometimes leave the meeting and then go warn their neighbors if they wanted to, to sa help save them. Um, rescuers negotiated for the release, safety, or sparing of Tutsi's lives when people were caught. Sometimes this would happen at roadblocks where people would negotiate freedom for people. Um, they paid money or other goods for the release, safety, or sparing of Tutsis. Uh, in our testimony, it's very clear that thousands of Tutsi lives were saved at various moments for the price of a beer. Um, because often if you gave an inter enough money for a beer, he would decide that he had better things to do, like go drink beer. Um, they hid and protected Tutsi children. Often, particularly in April, many of the killings in neighborhoods, the parents would be killed and the children would not be killed. They would be left behind. And often neighbors would go and find them and take them into their own homes, hide them. Uh, if they were near the border, they would find ways to evacuate them across the border, etc. Smuggling Tutsis across the border, providing food or other assistance. Keep in mind, this was going on for months. Even if a Tutsi found a successful place to hide that wasn't at someone's house. They need to have at least a minimal amount of food and water to make it through. Helping Tutsis to flee or run by distracting Interahamwe or sending them in the wrong direction. Um, and we documented one case in detail and others have document documented cases where um, rescuers who were protecting Tutsis at sites stayed with them and fought against the attackers. Um, again, just like perpetrators though, rescuers also were having to repeatedly make decisions over time of how to behave. <clears throat> and so often, someone might have been a rescuer for weeks and weeks until one day they made the other decision. Um, and I have testimony, I actually have a really compelling testimony that I got from um, a perpetrator in 2011, he was Tutsi. 
Um, and he gave his testimony with a woman sitting next to him and he had killed her brother. And she had witnessed it at a roadblock. And he had been at that roadblock for hours and he had been tortured by the inter way there. And they kept ordering him to kill the other man. And then eventually he couldn't take it anymore and he stabbed him. And then he ran away. And his own life was eventually spared. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that people often face. Now, not every perpetrator was coerced in that way to perpetrating. Um, but you can imagine if you were the witness to that event, you might decide to participate much quicker if you knew what could be done to you if you didn't comply with these orders. So those kinds of actions uh, lowered people's ability to resist. Um, one common way that rescuers helped Tutsis um, in border towns was to smuggle them across the border. This is in the town of Giseni. That is the border with the Congo, that wall. And that is a door through the wall into someone's garden. So I show this to you to illustrate that we often think of the border as a fortress, but many places around the world, the border is an imaginary line going through a field. Um, in the town of Giseni, uh, in 1994, parts of the border were walls with doors and parts of the border were just open space. There were, of course, the official border crossings, but you were in a context where if you knew where to cross the border, you could get across without being detected. Now, of course, the inter and the police who were hunting for people also knew these routes, so we had to use them carefully and with a great deal of savvy. Um, and so this is a door. This is a path next to that door going up the hill, this path here. This photo was taken in 2013. Um, and this path was shown to us by an Enda Kimwa uh, from the town of Giseni. He was a trader. Um, but like many people who engage in trade and border towns, um, much of what he traded did not go through the customs house. Um, he was engaged in informal uh, exportation, importation of goods. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just uh, about 100 meters from this path, he has a house. He still has that house today. Um, one of his wives lives in the house. He has another wife who lives in another part of the town. Um, but I interviewed him in that house, and I can tell you in that house there was uh, one of the rooms, the main room of the house, was full of mattresses. It was being used as a storehouse. I didn't ask which direction the mattresses were going because I, I didn't want to know. Um, in any case, he explained that he used his knowledge of smuggling goods across the border to smuggle Tutsis across the border. He did this without pay. He did this without compensation. Um, he described many of the ways he did this. Sometimes it was using these paths. Other times it was using the real official border crossing and hiding people in barrels um, and various other means to get them across. Um, another route, this is Lake Kivu, a massive lake on the border of uh, Rwanda and the Congo. Um, in the rural town that was mostly Muslims where we lived, these people made their life, livelihood from fishing and also from um, informal exportation and importation of goods, not passing through the custom house. Um, and this is a place where many people engaged in evacuating Tutsis across the lake in their boats, um, usually under cover of night. Um, many of the people engaged in this, they did extort or they did ask for payment for their services. Um, some did it for free and just out of the goodness of their heart. But many different stories of getting across Lake Kivu this way. Um, in other parts of Rwanda, further from the border, those weren't options. That's where they employed hiding and other kinds of strategies. Um, I should go back, actually, just to the Giseni one. So um, in Giseni, uh, one of the survivors we interviewed, he was a child in the genocide and his elderly neighbor had saved him after his parents had been killed uh, and he had witnessed that event. And she took him across the border and she took many children across the border by carrying them on her back and pretending they were her grandchildren. And so she would take them across the border um, and leave them either with their own relatives if they knew that they had relatives on the other side of the border or with her relatives if she had some. 
Um, now she did this, her, her daughter was a member of the Interahamwe and engaged in the genocide and she, her daughter often threatened to have her killed for what she was doing. Um, she never t t did that, but it was a threat. Um, and so that's how he was saved um, from being killed. Um, in any case, hopefully this, um, my description of the decision making people underwent makes this typology seem less clear. Um, people were, at any given moment, someone could be in one block and one action moved them to another. So you're never, while you might be a rescuer now, five minutes later you c could become a perpetrator or a victim depending on what decision you made and what decisions people around you made. So to illustrate this even further, this is a statement from a perpetrator. I would say this is one of the most chilling statements I got from a perpetrator about why he did what he did. I had asked, why, how did you decide to participate in the ge genocide? He didn't answer the question repeatedly. I kept asking the same question over and over again in different ways. And finally he said, there was no decision. We were in a group of evildoers. They trained us to kill. We were together in a group. We watched what was happening, what others were doing. We don't all have the same heart. It's like the bus on the highway coming from Kigali going to Huye. The bus comes and stops for you. You get on and off you go. For me, why this is chilling is there's not much you can do to keep people from this. But it is the reality, this is how mob violence works. We know that by just looking at other forms of mob violence, not that in genocide. This kind of a statement indicates that you have to focus also in prevention on the structural factors that make this kind of violence possible. This is why when you have mob violence, there has to be investigations, there has to be prosecutions, the rule of law is an important thing. Um, this is from a victim, a, s a segment of an in interview about, I asked, how did you choose the people to whom you asked for help? Because the other thing is most survivors weren't helped by one person. They were often helped by 20 people, different people every day. S many people they didn't know helped them. Um, so I said, how did you choose the people to whom you asked for help? Response. You would just run and go anywhere. Once they didn't chase you, you would spend the night there. Some people would send you on your way and they would say go. And sometimes you would need to push it and once they allowed you, you would stay there. So you didn't make any calculations to decide whom to ask for help? No, it was like committing suicide. Sometimes you could hide somewhere and the next day the person would be like, get out before they kill me as well and you would go elsewhere like that. Do you know why some people helped you when other people sent you away? It depends on the person's heart. Sometimes you could see that a person was feeling sorry for you, that he was really saddened by what was happening. There is a place where I went, went to hide and they almost killed me themselves. They said, you've killed the father, referring to the president. Um, I asked, am I the one who killed him? So just to give you a sense, even, even victims are having to make decisions in this context, impossible decisions, decisions where there is not a clear right answer. Um, and then this, these are some statements from rescuers, very typical statements when we asked why did you do it or we asked others why did rescuers do what they did. It depends on the person's heart. This is uh, in Rwanda, in Rwandan understandings of the, of the person and how it works, your heart is where your mind is. Your mind and your emotions are in your heart. The brain is not relevant in their conception of how the body works. Um, so it depends on the person's heart, a less artistic, poetic translation, it depends on someone's mind, what they, it depends on what someone thinks or feels. Um, another one, I cannot look into their mind and heart to find out what they were thinking about. Individual determination and the will of God give values to the word of God so that he will save a person's soul in the future beyond this life. Many people would mobilize religious moral grounding for theirs. Many other people wouldn't. So many were the top one a sense of a common humanity, not based in religion, a moral orientation that's not based necessarily in religion. And then the last one from a Muslim, the people I have saved, it's not that I had another force to save them, it is God who helped me and my good heart, that's all I can say. Um, and then a last one, one of the most compelling ones, um, oh, 
actually no, this is not the last one, but another religious one. In a person's life you see some sad things and you feel that you must do what's good because that's the most important thing on earth. Doing good is better than doing evil. When we pray, the Quran teaches us love. The reason why we did those things, we were acting according to the teachings we get. We did all that out of love because we felt that the people for whom we were doing them were Rwandans too, and because they were innocent. Not everyone was part of Inyenzi in Kotani. Not all Tutsis went to war. This Inyenzi in Kotani, that's a combination of the um, Inkotani is the name of the RPF in Kenya Rwanda. Inyenzi means cockroach. However, that's often given as an example of dehumanizing in Rwandan propaganda. But Inyenzi was also the name of Tutsi rebels right after um, the end of colonialism who came back and tried to overthrow the elected Hutu president of Rwanda. So it's not the best example of dehumanizing in Rwandan propaganda. When people call you snakes is a better example in that dialect. Because in Yenzi, in the genocide, was almost always referring to warriors and the RPF in coded language and not necessarily to um, insects. So this is one of the most compelling ones. This was a very poor man, a very poor farmer, a Muslim, in this very rural town where we got some amazing interviews. And I asked, he saved probably 30, 40 people by rowing them in his boat across the lake. Um, and I said, why did you help these people? And he responded, as poor as I am, how could I bear to lose heaven and earth in the same lifetime? So he was like, I'm so poor in this life. I'm so miserable. Um, how could I not hope to have heaven? And I wouldn't have heaven if I did those evil things. Now, these statements about rescuers and by rescuers reflect the standard narrative about rescue. Um, the standard narrative is rescuers are good people who do good things or who did good things. Um, the truth, however, is far more complex. Uh, what the key finding from my research is that um, like perpetrator behavior, rescuer behavior was an improvisation in the midst of changing conditions. Um, so the compulsion to help, what social psychologists often call altruism, the compulsion to help was the beginning but not the ending of rescue. Rescue was a decision made repeatedly in rapidly changing contexts and sometimes under intense pressure. To succeed, re rescuers had to persist in their decision to help and be courageous in the face of increasing threats to their and their kin's well-being. Many rescuers who hewed faithfully to a path of moral rectitude were killed along those with they attempted to save. So many of those who had a strong moral compulsion and wanted to do the right thing, doing the right thing in the genocide led to them dying along with the people they were protecting. Um, rescuers who succeeded in saving people often wended a morally dubious path through the gray zone of genocide to achieve good outcomes. Um, I think one of, the most, um, one of the most compelling stories I have of this is of a priest who ran an orphanage in southern Rwanda. Uh, in the orphanage, before the genocide started, he had Tutsi children, he had Hutu children, he had Hutus who had been displaced by the war from the north and because of that were radicalized in their politics. They were aligned with Hutu power ideologies, um, but he did what he could as uh, running this orphanage to get them to um, be, treat the other children nicely, whether they were Hutu or Tutsi. When the genocide began, um, Tutsi children who had survived in neighboring places were brought to the orphanage, so he had a growing number of children protect, most of them Tutsis. Some of the staff of the orphanage were Tutsi too, and they stayed there to help and um, feed the children and take care of them. Um, and then he had to manage the radicalized, um, displaced Hutu teenagers that he had there to keep them from going and joining the intra humway or turning around and killing the other children who were with them. Um, at a certain moment in the genocide, the, the priests of the local Catholic parish were Tutsis. And they fled to the orphanage to hide there. Unfortunately, they were seen as they entered the grounds by a neighbor, 
And the neighbor went and reported to the um, local authorities and to the Intrahamwe that the priests were hiding at the orphanage. Someone at the police station called the um, foreign priest who ran the orphanage and said, you have a problem, they're gonna come and take those priests and we don't know if we can keep the Intrahamwe out, if they do. So he went to the priests and he said, this is the situation, um, I don't know what's gonna happen. He didn't ask them to leave, but clearly by telling them what was about to happen, um, the question was implicit in what he was saying. And so the priests left and they were killed somewhere else. But as he told me, as the foreign priest told me the story, it's very clear that he has to live with that moral complicity in the deaths of the priests. He did, he made a really difficult decision, but the hundreds of children at the orphanage survived. And um, so those are the kinds of decisions often that rescuers have to make. Um, so finally, um, the other important finding is that there's no structural model of rescuer behavior. There's not a set of criteria we can say someone who has these characteristics will be a rescuer. Um, so there's no structural model of rescuer behavior because successful rescue is the end result of thousands of moment by moment decisions unfolding over time. We can do things to encourage those decisions to lead to certain outcomes, but we can't do, there's no all encompassing control of the context in which people are operating. Um, some other minor findings, one thing is about rescue and testimony. Um, early on in this research, a national representative of Ibuka said there have been moments when it was impossible to talk about rescuers during the genocide. Immediately afterward, many of us tried to recognize the people who saved us, but we discovered it wasn't wise. The government didn't want to hear about it, the new government. Um, one survivor uh, in a rural area early on in this research said, it was difficult to rescue. It would be better to talk to a Hutu who will tell the story, but it is difficult because of their safety. They are still afraid. Um, the reason being that there have been many instances where people have been publicly recognized as rescuers and then are implicated in the genocide and face trial and are imprisoned. Now, I'm sur sure some of those people, those were legitimate things that they had done and legitimate crimes, but um, we're not sure if always that was the case um, and from someone who attempted to rescue, I tried to save someone. He stayed here in my house for four weeks after he climbed over the rear, rear wall. I kept him here. Then we decided to flee. We could not bring him with us. I don't know what happened to him. I do not say these things because people can misunderstand or twist my words to say that I am the one who had him killed. So this is someone, he tried to help someone. He doesn't know what happened to him, um, but he doesn't tell people publicly what he did because someone might say, oh, you're the one who had him killed. Um, so, a few additional conclusions. Um, many rescuers in Rwanda wish to remain an anonymous and unrecognized. So while I do think Ibuka's efforts to recognize Enda Kemwa are important, um, we should also let perhaps the person who's identified as having been an endocomo decide if they want to be published on a, on a public list. Regional variation in the patterns of the genocide and patterns of rescue are important. There were different patterns of violence and there were marked differences in the history and patterns of Islam. Islam is relevant in part to the story. I haven't told that part of the story today. You can ask about it in the Q&A if you want. Another um, finding is that rescuer behavior was widespread. Many Rwandans' initial reaction was to try to help people. Not all, but many. Um, and many Rwandans engaged in rescuer behavior for days or even weeks until they perceived it was no longer possible. Um, and then rescue, rescuer is a more, morally problematic category. Many cases of rescue that we uncovered Rescuers could not protect everyone, um, and so they sacrificed a few to save the lives of many. And time is an important factor in genocide narratives and testimony, especially when issues like rescue are politicized. So there have been different moments in the post-genocide trajectory of Rwanda where it's been impossible 
and more possible to talk about rescue. And it hasn't been a constant increase in possibility. Um, I think in 2009 was a high point where it was quite possible to talk about rescue. And then there's been a period of less, less public discussion of rescue in Rwanda. Um, although there's more and more research being done about it, so perhaps we're seeing uh, increasing ability to talk about it. So I'll end it there, and thank you for your attention. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Great question. That was one of the things we specifically investigated is individual rescue versus collective rescue. Um, the most common strategy we found was loose networks of people engaged in rescue, but those networks transformed over time. Uh, in that, um, by not knowing everyone else involved in a network of rescue, you protected those other rescuers. Now I can say in a household, it's not possible in a Rwandan household, an average Rwandan household, to be hiding someone in the house and not have the family know. Mm -hmm. So in most instances, if the husband was involved in rescue, the wife was as well. She was cooking the food, for example. Um, often we did encounter where there would have to be intense negotiations between spouses, where one agreed and the other disagreed about whether to rescue or continue to rescue. Um, and those didn't always turn out going towards rescue. Often when one spouse became reluctant or felt it was too dangerous, that would be a point where it would tip the other way. Um, another interesting fact actually is we found is that often it was the children would initiate the rescuing. Mm -hmm. um, and then the parents would decide or not, aside, not decide to go along. Um, so one young, like one young man, he was 18, in Rwandan conceptions, that's still very much a child, and he invited his high school friend to come into the home. His parents agreed for him to stay there and they saved him and eventually smuggled him across the border. Um, another famous case um, of someone running to the gate and an 11 year old girl let, let the Tutsi man in and then he was saved by the family. Um, so there are those instances as well. Um, we have one sample in, the, in our, one of our sites, um, Muganda Mure, which is in southern Rwanda. It historically was a Swahili camp under colonialism. Under colonialism, Muslims in Rwanda were called Swahili. Um, and so they were in ghettos under the colonial, Belgian colonial government. Um, and they had to live in um, the ghettos and they had to have laissez passes to even leave them. So Muganamori was a historic Swahili camp and so the structure of the community was still such that the old walls, they weren't there anymore, but still the buildings were structured that it was very easy to close that neighborhood off from the outside. So there, the Muslims erected their own roadblocks in the first hours of the genocide to protect themselves. And what they did is they did not, they let they would let Tutsis who were fleeing in, and they would not let the inter way or police in to come search for people. So there they saved hundreds of people um, in this means. Now, there are a couple people in that community who ended up dying, and that's because someone in the community betrayed um, and allowed the police in to search for specific people, and they took them and we killed them. But largely, they succeeded there, and that was definitely a collective effort. Um, another place we did interviews was a mosque where um, Hutus and Tutsi Muslims came together in that mosque in the early days of the genocide. They invited their Tutsi neighbors to come join them. Um, and then they were attacked by a police force and the Intrahamwe. 
and they all stayed and fought against the attackers. Um, many people survived that massacre, but also many people died. And the first person at that place to die was one of the Muslim Hutu men leaders of that religious community. So, does that answer your question? Yes. Um, <coughs> Um, oh, for the Ibuka study? Yeah, yeah, or if, like, if you, like, saw any sort of, like, kickback from the government in any way. Um, for the Ibuka study, I don't think there was government resistance. <laughs> I think it's more, I think there is, there is some internal <coughs> debate in Rwanda over whether a non-governmental organization, Ibuka, should be in charge of remembering the genocide and um, protecting the country's history or whether the government should be leading those efforts. I would say that the real problem for Ibuka to continue that study has been funding. They haven't been able to get it funded. And I would say that most of the funding coming internationally into Rwanda tends to go through government institutions now. Um, so the degree, it's hard to measure the degree to which that's a government directive or something or just an outcome of policy decisions. Um, in terms of my own involvement in this research, we did not face any opposition from the government in this research. And local officials were vital to us getting interviews with people and talking to people. So, yes? Did you find that there was a difference in willingness to help or rescue between the genders? Yeah, well, so my, my background in Rwanda is primarily, I was always doing research focused on women. And about three weeks into doing the interviews for this, I was checking like our, if we were staying on target for our sampling strategy, and I was like, holy moly, we have 95% men in our sample. This isn't what I meant. <laughs> um, and so I then I, ha I realized I had to, when I was asking for interviewees, I had to specifically say, and we also want to talk to women. Um, so it was kind of a lesson, a reminder to me of the ways that gender norms are still very much in play in Rwanda as much as things have changed. Mm -hmm. And that usually if you want to talk to, if you want to get information about something, it's assumed you only need to talk to the head of household who is usually a man. Mm -hmm. And so, the assumption was, for instance, often when couples were rescuing, we would be given the man to talk to of the household and not his wife. Um, and so I I, we began to recognize that if we talked to the husband, we had to also <laughs> specifically ask to interview the wife. Then the challenge would be, is she, she would often be sitting there during the husband's interview and then she'd say, yeah, he already told you everything, I don't need to add anything. So it was sometimes challenging to get um, at those gender aspects. Um, so I would say from our data we can't say anything too much about whether gender made a difference. There are, we do have examples, there's several in the Kemo, though who are women. There's some others, there, I don't know that it's 50-50, I haven't checked the data on that, but. Yes? I'm also curious if family histories before the genocide made a difference uh, in decisions that their spirits made. Very much so. Um, that notion of a common humanity, it was very clear that people, that that was what your parents taught you about the world and your place in it and what kinds of people were in the world. So families that minimized ethnicity as a relevant factor in passing on knowledge to their children, those would be people who are more disposed towards not understanding why genocide made sense and not wanting to participate. Yeah. Yes, ma'am.
side, it could be cheaper to shop on the other side. And uh, people crossed uh, openly without these uh, barriers or anything like that. So um, I believe it's possible that um, people from the center of R Rwanda did not know the border crossing, but certainly everybody that lived in the Kivu area knew about them uh, because it was a normal thing. Mm -hmm. Um, most of the cases we documented of evacuation across the lake, um, we mostly spoke with the people involved in helping people cross. We didn't get very many people who were the survivors who had crossed that way. Um, because what we found is in those instances that often those survivors are not living in Rwanda anymore. They've often gone abroad, usually outside of Africa in many cases. So we ha weren't able to track them down. So of the stories we have of where they went, it's often that they had family connections because you're familiar with the region, so you know that there are plenty of uh, Kinyarwanda speakers in the Kivus. And often families were transnational in that they had cousins and other things on the other side of the border. So they would often go to extended family. Um, among the traders, for example, many men traders, part of their strategy is they have wives in different countries. So they would leave them with their other wives. Um, and then the other place would be refugee camps um, or seeking that kind of assistance. Uh, we, there were some cases where um, certain, can, I did get one or two stories of people who were evacuated and then they were attacked by Congolese actually after they got there and had to flee to a third place. Um, in general, they would try to get to Goma if they could because it was close enough to Rwanda that anybody who lives in Giseni town has a friend in Goma because it's really one city with a border through it. So um, they would, if they went across the lake, they would often try then to get to Goma because um, they would know people there. So, yes. I'm curious of um, when we talk about the motivations, it sounds like there's like the initial motivation and then there's sort of the sort of sustenance sustaining, like, were there differences that, particularly when it comes to um, the faith angle, like, that impetus to do something versus how do you keep on doing it, whether they're continuing practicing with their faith or whatever it is, or somehow yeah. touching base with that, how do they sustain themselves? Um, we do have some cases where faith was used as a mean to maintain that persistence. Um, we have one example, um, this is from the capital city, and it was Muslims who were hiding um, Tutsi Christian neighbors. And throughout the course of the whole genocide, they essentially went into an intensive prayer meditation retreat environment where they were fasting several days a week, and they were praying most of those days. They would pray collectively, um, switching between Muslim and Christian sort of prayers. Um, now that's, that's a, I would say that's exceptional. Um, there's one instance in the south of an Adventist church that was involved collectively in um, protecting Tutsis and there um, definitely uh, faith was used as part of maintaining that sustenance. The Italian priest I mentioned, he also was, it was normal at the orphanage anyways, mass was held every morning um, and vespers every evening and he would make the homily have to do with the current situation to keep, try to keep morale up and keep the children doing what they should be doing to stay safe. Um, I think beyond that though, plenty of the people we interviewed, they might have been religious, but they weren't intensively practicing. A, re a difference that religion did make is in Rwanda, the, due to the history of Islam in the country, there were lots of, um, so because of how Islam is practiced and the notion that you're Muslim and nothing else, um, once you became Muslim, you were Muslim and you forgot, in theory, if you were Hutu or Tutsi beforehand. But there was a great deal of marrying of Tutsi women into Muslim families. 
And so there's intensively multi-ethnic backgrounds in the Muslim families, and it's clear that that played a role in many Muslims engaging in rescue, in more rescue. Um, in our sample, I can't determine whether that pattern holds up as well for Christian families that had lots of Tutsi in marriage, because our sample's not structured for that kind of analysis. Um, so I hope that answers a bit your question. Um, I think a, just a, either a deep belief in wanting to do what was right, whether or not based in religion, or um, emotional attachment to the people that they were helping. Uh, many of the people you people were saving were their relatives, their neighbors, their friends. Not always, but often. And there was the religious motivation. There was also mentioned the motivation of, I didn't want to commit a sin that would keep me out of heaven. Anything else? Yes. Just um, two basic questions. Um, the first is you mentioned that uh, the categories of Tutsi and Tutsi it existed before the colonial period, but um, changed quite a bit um, under colonialism. I was just wondering if you could provide a bit more background about that. And then um, my second question uh, related to the religion question. I know that some scholars of the Holocaust have claimed that it's not so much religiosity which predicts rescuer behavior, it's whether or not you've been a member of a religious group which has a history of persecution within the area. Um, so, and I was just wondering if that reads up, if that kind of sociological category reads at all onto yeah. the situation or not. Yeah, that's part of why we looked, we did a comparison between Islam and Christianity because of this identified um, concept in the, in the literature. Um, and so we assumed we would find that Muslims participated less because they were, Muslims were strongly marginalized in Rwanda all the way up until the genocide. They were excluded from education um, and lots of other things. They were spoken of negatively. Um, in any case, I would say that our data, because we included, we also included Northwestern Rwanda because we, I knew that there was widespread Muslim participation in the genocide. Um, and so I wanted to understand the differences there. And I would say that um, I think my research calls into question the sociological finding because you have that widespread Hutu participation. But that there it's because the, the Hutu power political parties that created the genocide and implemented the genocide had very strong power bases there to be someone, whether a businessman or a politician or anything, anyone of importance, you had to have social ties to those political parties because of patronage systems. And so there, those, that patronage with those people who became implicated in the genocide overrode um, a sense of not participating. Now, that's also a place where you have wide, a lot of the Muslims, though, who participated in the genocide also saved thousands of people. One of the famous ones, Hassan Ngezi, who was the head of the propaganda in the genocide. I have lots of, I have lots of um, testimony in my data of him taking hundreds of people across the border. So um, it's where, that's where we get this picture of human beings are very complex things and make decisions not always in rational sort of thinking ways. Um, I would say in the South, the pattern does hold up and Muslims in the South they said part of why I, I didn't, th these were innocent people just as Muslims have always been innocent of the things they accused us of. They would give that as an, a reason for why they did what they did. So I think it, it matters, but maybe it's not as determining as um, some of the other research has said. Do Muslims in the South have less political power? Yes, Muslims in the South didn't affiliate with political parties because they didn't need to because the patronage networks weren't as tied into those hardliner political parties. The genocide is about ethnicity, but it's largely also about politics, and politics in Rwanda is largely about region. Mm -hmm. The center of power of the people who implemented the, in, the genocide was northwestern Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And so if you were a Hutu in northwestern Rwanda, it was far harder to not become a participant. Um, and other research, uh, Omar McDumas published some on this, Leanne Fuji discusses it in, in her research, the notion that the more social ties 
you, uh, someone had to perpetrators, the more likely they were to become a perpetrator. So, um, in terms of your first question about ethnicity in Rwanda, um, so these categories, Hutu, Tutsi, and Twa, did predate colonialism. They meant different things in different regions. There's lots of historical data showing that. They were, however, first politicized before colonialism in that um, in the mid-18th century, um, there was an expansion of the kingdom um, to have sovereignty over areas that formerly had Hutu chiefs that didn't, they paid tribute to the central court, but they didn't recognize other aspects of the political authority. Um, they came under a new kind of political authority from the central court, and in that um, expansion, corvée labor was imposed on all Hutus, but not on all Tutsis, a certain form. So that's the first time where that difference begins to matter for ordinary people in a new way. Um, definitely under coloni colonialism, there was radical changes. Become, it, it, the categories became racialized because the Germans and the Belgians brought their ideas about race and racism with them and imposed their own sort of new framework on Rwandan society and understood Hutu, Tutsi, much in the same way that Belgians understand the differences between Walloons and Flemish and creating that social hierarchy. And then um, they, the, the colonialists impo imposed new forms of co corvée labor that only applied to Hutu and didn't apply to Tutsi. Uh, and um, they also then eventually eliminated Hutu from positions of power they formerly had held. Um, and other sort of transformations took place. The form Western style education was limited to Tutsis. Tutsi men, I should say. Yes, Martha? Um, thank you for your talk. I love how it troubles the paradigm and genocide studies of these categories that we like to put people in, and I'm wondering how Rwandans talk about those categories or reconcile this troubling or complexity that your research reveals. I mean, the people for whom you identified rescue or behavior but might have perpetrated acts of, during the genocide, for them, how do they, how, how are they talking about these categories and where they stand in relation, or maybe they're not talking about these categories at all, but how do they, how are they talking about where they stand in relation to this history, and particularly in the context of the Gachacha and the, um, yeah, the public forms of telling? Yeah, um, I would say perpetrators mostly don't talk about much of anything. <laughs> Um, and even to get interviews with them was really tough, and those were the hardest interviews for us to do because there was a great deal of reluctance to reply to our questions. They would reply, but it was non-responses often, yeah. or responses that clearly felt deceptive. Um, often people would say, they would come to interview and they would say, yes, um, I was in prison, but I was released and I was found not guilty, where I knew that they had confessed to crimes or been a, found guilty of crimes. Mm -hmm. And so I would let them get away with that for the while and then I would come back and I said, well, you know, you said you spent this many years in prison, like how is that possible? Because I knew and I know enough about Rwandan history to sort of counter them. And then eventually they would say, well, yes, okay, yes, I was, I did confess to something, but I just confessed to get out of prison anyways. Sometimes they would be more open. I think the most interesting interview I had with a perpetrator, I interviewed him multiple times. In 2011, I interviewed him and he said that he hadn't done anything in the genocide and that he was found guilty just because he went to a roadblock as he was required to, but he never participated in killing or anything like that. Um, I came back to him later and he'd begun to speak at public events uh, around the genocide um, and it seems at some point he had a change of understanding of his role and he was uh, a mix he was a Hutu he was he was Muslim he was 19 years old at the time of the genocide his father was Hutu his mother was Tutsi mm -hmm. and um, so he explained that um, and I think his mixed race heritage is part of why he didn't perceive of himself as a perpetrator 
um, for a long time. And then what he had begun to, is I, I re went and re-interviewed him. People I was talking to and s said, you need to go talk to this guy. And then I realized I'd already talked to him. So I interviewed him again. And he said, well, yes. I said, you know, you've, you're changing what you said. So can you explain sort of what happened? And he said, well, you know, I finally came to understand that even if I didn't pick up a, a machete, even if I didn't do these things, my simple presence there gave the inter Humway power. So by standing with them, it made them more powerful and it made the people they were, they were targeting more weak. Because the more of us were there, the less the others felt like they could stand up to us. Mm -hmm. And so he finally had come to recognize a role in the genocide. So I think that's, for me, that's one of the most fascinating finds. I mean, it's one of the 200 plus people. Um, and then I would say, for people who are in the rescuer behavior category who saved people and also participated, in Rwandan discourse, they're perpetrators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're not talked about as anything else. Um, and Rwandans, I have not heard much discussion of a category of bystanders in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's because it's a very polarized discourse there. It tends to be boiled down to most often victims and perpetrators and as the student who was here who'd been to Rwanda explained there's not you can't be Hutu and a survivor in general like that's not really something you can be um, it's not entirely true because there are there are leading members of certain of the rest of the genocide survivor associations who are for instance Hutu widows of Tutsi men killed in the genocide so it's not not a whole rule, but there is a general notion. If you say survivor, people assume you mean Tutsi survivor. Mm -hmm. um, and you rarely will hear, even Hutus who did have family members who were killed in the genocide as part of the genocide, they will not talk about themselves in public as survivors. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it's so sort of, complexity. it's more complexity and I think there has been there was an attempt called Induma in Rwanda, this nationwide campaign of talking about being a Rwandan as opposed to being Hutu, Tutsi, or Twa. And part of that was to, there was a brief opening around that of, of more people giving testimony with more complexity in it. And that was between about 2013 and 2014. That's largely, you don't see that anymore. It started off that way and then it transformed and it became these very formulaic pronouncements that more had to do with, um, I saw more people admitting their, their complicity in the genocide and no, not also being able to talk about ways that they also had been victimized in some way. So, so I'm not trying to formulate this question exactly, but you know, there, there've been sort of like rumblings about like organized Muslim rescue here and there whispered nothing really formally published about it. Um, and, and you have highlighted the extremely marginalized role that Muslims have played in Rwandan society. And I have noticed just like visually, because you can usually see Muslims in Rwanda because they're headscarf women and no one else wears headscarf. There are many more Muslims now than, now than there were in 2006. And certainly since, like, since before the genocide. So I'm wondering if there might be a link between, like if you, if there is some publication, there's some recognition that like, wow, Muslims contributed to the genocide history, not just as perpetrators, but as rescuers, is that gonna help like the status of this growing community in Rwanda? Like how might it help with social integration right. of a formulary model? Oh yeah, there's, it's definitely played a huge role and um, there hasn't been much published in scholarly sources. There's one public policy report, which if you want, I can get you the citation for. I'm forgetting the organization that paid for it, but one of the authors on it is Kristen Doty, who's gone on and become a scholar after she worked on it. But it is a publication that documents how Muslims behaved in the genocide. It, that was the Kigali example you gave, right? Um, well, no. no. Um, I mean, I have other data. Part of my data, though, d does not confirm some of what they found in that report. Yeah. Um, although largely, it confirms large parts of what they found. Um, so, uh, but I would in that's one one publication that is available. Um, I do hope to write on that aspect of this project. Um, 
But it has already made a difference. Eid al-Fitr is now a national holiday in, in Rwanda, the day to bring Ramadan to a close. Um, it was added in the early 2000s, or actually, officially it was added in the early 2000s as a national holiday, but immediately after the genocide, it started becoming a national holiday. The president would just declare it a national holiday. Um, but now it's by law a national holiday. Um, there are important, there are several, there's always a cabinet member who is from the PDI, which is, they used to be the Parti Democratique Islamique, but you're not allowed to have religious political parties in Rwanda, so I think they changed, I is now Independence or something like that, instead of Islamique, but everyone knows it's the Muslim party. They usually have one cabinet member um, who's for that party, they have some seats in parliament. Um, I would say most of the Muslims I know in Rwanda, um, they tend to be RPF members. Um, not always, but mostly. Um, there are still Muslims that we interviewed in the study that said, Islam says we shouldn't be involved in political parties. Those Muslims are wrong. See what happened in the genocide. We really shouldn't do that. So there, there's some pushback on it. Um, definitely, I would say Islam has contributed to the spread of, I, I mean, how what happened in the genocide and Muslims' perceived behavior has contributed to, in part, to the growth of Islam in Rwanda. There are other factors as well. Um, if you convert to Islam, you have a whole new social network of, of patronage that becomes open to you. So lots of young men become Muslim because they don't have other educational opportunities and they know if they become Muslim, they'll get access to driving school and then they might get a, small, a, a cheap loan to get a car and become a taxi driver and other kinds of things. I'm not saying it's all, it's only economic motivation, but there are other incentives there. Um, many of the Muslim schools in the country don't charge any tuition or school fees, so that attracts more. An in interesting aspect too is the Muslim schools in the country, all of the girl children wear, um, cover their heads, but not all of them are Muslim, but it's part of the uniform for the school. Um, so even though you see them with heads covered, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're Muslims. I should add, most Pentecostal women in Rwanda also cover their heads, but they do it in a different style, so, yeah. 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 Well, I think we'll bring it to a close with that. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you.